Welcome to our presentation today. My name is Andreas Chera. I'm the CEO of Golden Helix. With me is Mrs. Autumn Lovebaum, who is the main presenter of today's topic. On behalf of Golden Helix, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar. For those of you who have joined us for the first time, we do these events on a regular basis, about once a month. For this webinar, we have registrations from all over the world. And over the last year, we average about four to eight hundred registrations per event. Our goal is it to give the community an overview of best practices in the context of our toolset. Well, today's topic is making NGS data analysis clinically practical, repeatable and time-effective workflows. As we go along today, if you have any questions about this topic, please type them in the question pane of your webinar software. We are monitoring your comments, your questions, and at the end of the presentations, we plan to go through them and try to answer as many as possible in the allotted time. Please allow me to give you a bit of a wider context on today's topic. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the case of Kelly Carey made it to the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Initially, her prognosis in 2010 was dire. Lung cancer, three months. Mrs. Carey is still alive because her doctors were able to prescribe a drug based on the results of sequencing her tumor. It turned out that, her, uh, that Mrs. Carey has one of about 15 lung cancer variations which were discovered just in the last 10 years or so through next-gen sequencing. Based on this knowledge, some major cancer centers began to rethink their approach to treating the disease, and drug companies have begun the process of creating drugs to specifically target these types of cancer. So there's a true alternative to chemotherapy emerging, which works more like a shotgun approach. Here at Golden Helix, we're seeing the shift in our daily work as the latest research is now used more and more to diagnose disease and find the best possible treatment for a particular patient. Clinicians and researchers are working hand in hand in a way that wasn't previously possible. This trend is particularly evident in major cancer centers as well as children hospitals. The clinical applicability of DNA and RNA analytical tools is quickly becoming a reality. For us as a company, that means our tools must serve both worlds. We have empowered researchers for over 10 years to conduct complex analytical work and are committed to do the same thing for clinicians. The requirements supporting researchers are slightly different than for clinicians. From a researcher's perspective, the following topics are very important. Number one, scalability. Our flagship products in the Snip and Variation Suite can handle everything from a single gene panel to a whole genome sequence. In fact, some of our clients are conducting research on hundreds of exomes and whole genomes, and all this can be run on a desktop. This is the second important topic is visualization. We received a lot of kudos and compliments for a standalone genome browser, which gives researchers an interactive experience of viewing the NGS data in a streamlined and intuitive way. Actually, we, we have a little bit of a presenta uh, presentation of genome browsers embedded into this webinar. In an, our up and coming major release of SVS 8.0, we will integrate genome browser uh, to share the same visualization experience with our SVS clients. And then the third big topic on the researcher side is transparency. Researchers are very sensitive to any software package that behaves like a black box. Understanding what algorithms and methods have been implemented is critical so that results can be externally validated. To that end, we at Golden Helix document all the algorithms in SVS and the science behind them, and all of this is published online, so it's accessible. Uh, we have yet to find a competitor who does the same thing. Now, if I take a look on the clinical side, there are some other requirements that we have to keep in mind. Here, it's all about simplicity. Clinicians are required to spend a lot of time with patients, 
any tool they implement must therefore be intuitive and easy to use to make most of their time. Utilizing a pipeline and a workflow created by their counterparts on the research side, clinicians don't need to explore. They need their results fast and in an easy to read format. The second topic that is very important on the on the clinical side is compliance. Clinical applications or any tools, um, any application they are they are uh, utilizing uh, are surrounded by um, regulations and procedures, and results need to be repeatable. Ultimately, the output of any analytical work becomes part of the patient record, so compliance is very important. To date. Golden Helix has been able to contribute to the explosion of knowledge by making researchers more efficient. One of our customers told us that a few years ago conducting a TRIO analysis with conventional tools took him 14 days. With the Golden Helix software, he's now able to analyze 100 TRIOs within two hours. So we have really an exponential improvement here uh, in that time frame. But we don't want to stop here. By further automating a workflow, we'll be able to simplify the usage of SVS as well as the touch time needed by a non-expert um, and we will be able to reduce this down to the minute range. In the next 45 minutes will explain this particular topic in more detail. With that, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Mrs. Lovebaum. Autumn? Thank you, Andreas. Um, so first, I will take some time to talk about the status quo. I'll begin with discussing the initial strategy that someone new to genetic analysis might use to analyze their data. Then I'll touch on the advantages of using a genetic analysis software package, such as our flagship product, SNP and Variation Suite, or SVS. And finally, I'll discuss the advantages of using an automated workflow within SVS. And then I'll discuss um, many of the common steps that are found in a next generation sequencing tertiary analysis workflow. In the first workflow example, I'll demonstrate an automated workflow live using the Ogden family dataset and corresponding workflow in order to find the X-linked causal variant that's related to this disease. And then I'll walk through uh, the steps of a more complex trio analysis workflow that results in three distinct endpoints. And finally, I'll conclude with the Golden Helix process of developing a custom automated workflow. So at first, a scientist without access to um, a genetic analysis software package may initially use Excel to analyze their data. While this strategy works, it's often time consuming and tedious. The process usually involves comparing several columns and sorting them in order to pick out or remove variants that fit certain criteria. With this method, analyzing one trio may take weeks to complete. While a software designed for genetic data, such as SVS, makes this type of analysis more intuitive. And as a result, the complete workflow can be accomplished in a fraction of the time. Many of the steps that require sorting columns in Excel have dedicated functions in SVS, making each filtering process a matter of selecting a few interface options. That same workflow that would take weeks in Excel may take a couple of hours in SVS. Another SVS advantage is that all of the methods available in the software are well documented in the user manual. For the questions not easily answered by consulting the user manual, um, SVS users can take advantage of our talented and responsive support team. Unlike Excel, SVS is designed to handle large genetic data. The, the powerful toolbox built into the software can seem complex, but it strives to strike a balance between power and intuitive design. Automated workflows in SVS are far easier to learn, but less flexible by the fact that the well-defined workflows have specific preset thresholds with the intention of limiting user interaction. If you were looking for a tool to build a workflow or to investigate a variety of different genetic file types, while tweaking the options of the available methods, using SVS independently is a more obvious choice than an automated workflow. However, if you are a clinician that needs, a proven, that needs proven methods in repeatable processes that can be run on new sample sets, an automated workflow makes sense, and it will limit hands-on time, thus minimizing user error. 
We see SVS as a powerful tool that a research scientist can use to build a new workflow. Once that workflow is well defined and ready for repeatable use, an automated workflow is an easy to learn tool that clinicians can implement without needing the in-depth technical and statistical background. With automated workflows in SVS, the user creates a new project, selects the samples, and then clicks Start Workflow. All of the steps that are outlined in the initial dialog are then automatically performed in the order listed. The final workflow report is provided in an easy to read and customizable format. With transparency in mind, all of the intermediate results populated at each step in the workflow are available in the SVS project and can be ex examined for verification at any point upon completion. So this diagram shows a general overview of a typical analysis on next generation sequencing data. After the data runs through a secondary analysis pipeline that includes alignment and variant calling, the data will be in some sort of prelim preliminary format. We often see VCF files created by secondary analysis pipelines. A VCF file is a powerful yet complex file format, and it stores both variant calls and metadata at a sample level and a variant level. The, in the first step in this diagram, the data is filtered to coding regions of the genome. Uh, the example we have has, is uh, using exome data, and we are interested in exon regions. The information that's found in a VCF file that supports the variant calls can be used to determine the quality of each call. A common step in analyzing VCF files is to filter the data based on read depth and quality score. And this is to ensure that the final data set contains only high quality variants. In the VCF format, each call or genotype has a specific value for read depth and genotype quality. So the filtering is performed on a genotype by genotype basis. This could mean that at any given variant, one sample may have a high quality call while the other samples at the same variant will not. This genotype by genotype filtering level is unique. Most of the filtering methods in these workflows are done at a variant level, removing entire variants over all samples at a time. In the third step down, common variants are removed. And if the disease phenotype that you are studying is rare, as in it's not commonly found in the um, general healthy population, you would want to filter out variants using public data sets with known variant frequencies. This data set might be from 1000 Genomes or from the NHLBI Exome Sequencing Project. And this step will remove variants that are commonly found in the general population. Synonymous mutations do not cause an amino acid substitution and thus do not have a functional effect. Removing these variants allows you to focus on those that do cause amino acid substitutions. Once your data set is limited to functional variants, you can use functional predictions to determine if the substitution is likely to have a damaging impact on the function of the protein. And finally, depending on the characteristics of your phenotype, um, you may want to filter based on a specific inheritance pattern or variant pattern um, that would match based on match to the rest of your variants. So last year, Gay Broody gave a webcast um, about the research behind identifying a causal variant linked to Ogden syndrome and the SVS solution to this problem. I'm going to briefly discuss the background of the disease, um, but I encourage you to watch the recording of his webcast, which is available on our website um, for a more in-depth background. Ogden syndrome is known to cause premature death in males who inherit the disease. Females who have the X chromosome mutation in a heterozygous form are carriers of the disease, and then they can pass it along to their sons. Because males only have one X chromosome, the variant has a fatal effect on those who inherit it. It does not adversely affect females who have an additional copy of the X chromosome that provides protection. The disease is named after a family from Ogden, Utah, studied by Dr. Golson Lyon. At the time, members in this family were the only known cases. This pedigree represents three generations of that family, um, with the five blue shapes representing the five sequenced individuals. 
The dotted squares represent the known cases. The sequencing was done by an X chromosome exon capture kit, which means that the VCF files are relatively small and will process through the workflow quickly. Because we know this disease has a classical X-linked pattern, the study design intentionally included these five sequenced individuals, which are expected to follow a specific inheritance pattern for the causal variant. The two female carriers are expected to be heterozygous for the mutation. The two unaffected males um, that will serve as negative controls are expected to have reference calls and the affected male is expected to have inherited the variant. I'll switch over to my desktop um, and open SVS. Okay, so the first thing you see when you open SVS is the welcome screen. Um, from here you can either create a new project or open an existing project. And I have a project ready to go, so I'll open that. This project already has one spreadsheet in it. This is a pedigree spreadsheet. A pedigree spreadsheet is a special special spreadsheet type in SVS that is designed to explain family relationships. If you were doing any sort of family analysis in SVS, you will need one of these spreadsheets since it describes how the family members are related. And that could mean um, if you're doing a trio analysis or if you have a more complex family structure like Ogden. Um, to start the workflow, all you have to do is select the appropriate tool from the main toolbar and you're given an overview of the workflow that will be performed. Um, in the first, the first step in this workflow um, will import those, import the VCF files um, and upon import it will include the genotypes, the read depths, and the genotype qualities. Um, the next step will use those read depths and genotype qualities to filter um, such that a call will be dropped if its read depth is less than 10 or its genotype quality is less than 20. The next step will use the uh, NHLBI exome sequencing project um, to filter uh, if, the, if a variant is found in this data, database um, at any frequency. And the reason we do this is because we know Ogden syndrome uh, should not be found in any public database. Um, because it's, it's a very, very rare disease. Um, so we filter based on any frequency here. And the next step, we'll use the database of non-synonymous functional predictions um, to annotate the remaining variants. Next, variant classification is used to remove all variants that have a classification of something other than non-synonymous single nucleotide variation. And the final step, we'll apply that um, specific inheritance pattern um, to the remaining variants. So after you confirm that the workflow has all of the steps that you would like to perform, you click OK and you're given a few different project specific options. The pedigree spreadsheet is automatically detected. This base dataset name is used um, as the base dataset name for the VCF files after they're imported. Um, in this case, it defaults to the project name, um, which works. So the only action that I need to perform at this point is to add the VCF files. As you can see, I have both regular VCF files and compressed versions of these same VCF files. It doesn't matter which ones I choose here because it will use the compressed versions um, regardless. And if you don't have compressed VCF files, the importer will automatically compress and index each VCF file for you. So, and that makes the import a little bit faster. Okay, so after you select your samples, um, you're ready to go. So you click Start Workflow. Um, so the first step in that workflow, as we saw um, outlined in the initial dialog, um, is the VCF import. Uh, these VCF files um, are pretty small, so importing five of them isn't going to take very long. Um, and after this import finishes, you'll see um, several spreadsheets being created. Um, those spreadsheets 
um, include all of the metrics separately. So there's a spreadsheet for genotypes, a spreadsheet for read depths, and one for genotype qualities. There's also the VCF formatted 01 encoding spreadsheet. Uh, the next step uh, will create a sample collated spreadsheet that includes those VCF metrics. So um, the read depths and the genotype qualities um, will then be included in the final report. And then it will use those metrics um, to filter genotypes to no call. So this is removing all low quality calls um, from the data set. The next step removes those variants that are found in the NHLBI database. Um, if we, it's causing, if this variant is going to cause Ogden syndrome, it's not going to be found in that database. So we can safely remove all of those. The next step um, that already went is um, the step that uses the non-synonymous functional predictions. Um, and this is a combined database that aggregates several different functional prediction algorithms. Um, and for more information about this database, I recommend watching Dr. Bryce Christensen's webcast on downstream analysis. In that webcast, he goes into detail about the predictions and their algorithms. Um, and then variant classification just finished up. And that is used to filter out any variant that isn't classified as a non-synonymous single nucleotide variation. And finally, the inheritance pattern is applied. Um, and there's only this one remaining variant that we see in front of us. And this step is merging all of the annotation reports um, that were created at each step in this workflow. Um, and then selecting out the important information and creating a master annotation report um, for all of the variants found. And in this case, there's only the one variant. And the um, final variant information is also going to be summarized in an HTML report, which we see here. So this report tells you that um, only one variant passed all of those filters that we applied. Um, it's found in the X chromosome. The mutation changes from an A to a G in the NAA10 gene. And that mutation causes a serine uh, to change to a proline um, for the amino acid substitution. This workflow took about two and a half minutes. Um, and then you're given that same summary. And down here, you're given detailed log information. And so this gives you the time that each um, step was performed and then the specific options that each step used um, in, in the workflow. So if you were to recreate this in SVS, these are the options you would use. Okay. And then this master annotation report contains um, more information for that same variant that we just saw. So this report contains the genotypes, read depths, and genotype qualities for all five samples. Um, and we can see that the genotypes match that pattern. The read depths and genotype qualities are all pretty high and they're missing actually for the um, unaffected males and this is because um, homozygous reference calls are not included in these VCF files. After that, we see that the same to the same mutation is reported in the NHLBI database, but it's not found at any frequency in any of the samples. Again, the amino acid changed from a serine to a proline and is predicted as damaging by um, most of the algorithms in the database of non-synonymous functional predictions. The Fathom uh, program has a fundamentally different algorithm than the other programs. Um, so sometimes its predictions don't agree with the other predictions. Um, in general, we recommend uh, using all of this information to make a decision rather than um, trusting any one source over the other. Um, a combination of the sources is the best way to go about that we find. Um, then you're given the gene and transcript information along with the HGVS and classification information. Okay. And then finally you're given the final variants, in this case one variant, in a um, gene type spreadsheet. So this is the standard way um, that SVS likes to look at data with variants and columns and the samples in the rows. 
Okay, so now we'll go back to the presentation. Um, so as we saw, the, this variant was found in the NAA10 gene um, on the X chromosome, and it has a damaging effect on the protein, and in this case, a fatal phenotype. Normally, this gene encodes a protein that helps attach a chemical called acetyl groups uh, to the ends of other proteins. However, if a son inherits this X chromosome mutation, the protein structure is slightly altered and does not acetylate other proteins as well and this eventually leads to premature death. Now I'll go through the steps of a TRIO analysis workflow with three distinct variant types or endpoints. This workflow is more complex than the previous example since the distinct endpoints share some common workflow steps but also have unique steps specific to each variant type. This automated workflow reduced my hands-on time to about a minute uh, the bottleneck, however, in tertiary analysis is usually computation time, and this is largely determined by data size and machine performance. Running this um, automated workflow on one of our test machines uh, using one high coverage whole exome trio took approximately one hour. Running the same workflow on ten whole exome trios took about two and a half hours. The three endpoints that will be reported in this workflow are de novo mutations, rare recessive mutations, and compound heterozygous mutations. The complete workflow is represented by the diagram on the right of the screen. The three endpoints share many common steps, but branch out with distinct variant patterns that define the mutations. First I'll discuss uh, these distinct variant patterns in order to better understand these endpoints and then I'll go over the common and unique workflow steps. A de novo mutation is a spontaneous mutation that isn't found in either parent and is usually found in a heterozygous state in the child. This type of mutation could potentially impact the child with a phenotype that isn't observed in the parents. The variant pattern that we look for includes homozygous reference calls in the parents and a heterozygous call in the child. Homozygous de novo mutations, while possible, aren't likely and are usually considered a genotyping error rather than a true de novo mutation. In SVS, we provide the option to include these homozygous mutations, uh, but we do not include them in this workflow. A rare recessive mutation is one that is not commonly found in the general population and follows a recessive inheritance pattern. Specifically, the parents are heterozygous for the mutation and the child is homozygous. Compound heterozygous genes are those in which the child carries two heterozygous mutations, one inherited from each parent within the same gene. Some diseases attributed to compound heterozygosity include Tay-Sachs disease and sickle cell syndromes. In general, uh, the workflow outlined here would have been created by a researcher and then it would have been approved and compliant with the results from each intermediate step fully available for verification. This dialogue outlines the more complex workflow that will be performed. As in the previous example, the first step is to import the three VCF files and includes um, again includes the genotypes, the read depths, and the genotype qualities. Next, the tool will filter to exon regions as defined by the RefSeq gene track available from our Golden Helix data server. If this track is not found on the local machine, it will be automatically downloaded and saved locally before the workflow begins. And then the local version will be used the next time you run the workflow so that you don't have to um, re-download the track every time. Then the same read depth and genotype quality thresholds are applied. Um, and again, this is to ensure that only high quality variants are included in that final report. The next step annotates, based, uh, annotates the remaining variants against a track called genomic superdupes. And this track maps segmental duplications to the genome. 
If variants are found in these regions, their mapping may be nonspecific and should be considered carefully. Uh, you could also use this track to filter on in order to remove the regions um, from your variant set completely. However, in this workflow, uh, no filtering is applied, so the variant set remains the same. Next, the remaining variants are annotated against the database of non-synonymous functional predictions. If a variant is um, determined or predicted as benign by all five algorithms, it's removed from the data set. However, if at least one algorithm predicts it as damaging, um, it's kept. The final common workflow step is variant classification. And during this step, um, variants that are classified as synonymous or unknown are removed from the data set. Any variant that has a classification listed here is kept. And this includes non-synonymous SNVs, indels, frameships, etc. So now we are at the first break in the tree. De novo mutations are found by scanning uh, the remaining variants for the specific variant pattern. This is the first endpoint. The next step, which is performed using the previous variant set determined before the tree break, is filtering based on population frequency. This step will remove the variants that are commonly found in the general population, um, and the result is a rare variant set. In contrast to the Ogden workflow, uh, this workflow will only remove variants if the alternate allele frequency among the European American samples in this data set um, is greater than 1%. And this allows for phenotypes that are more common than Ogden syndrome, but still rare in the general population. Rare recessive variants um, are found by applying that recessive inheritance pattern um, to the rare variant set. The, uh, then from that same rare variant set, a different variant pattern match is used to find variants um, in which the child is heterozygous. And finally, a compound heterozygous filter is applied. Um, so each step outlined here would be at least one or two function operations in SVS. So it's obvious how repeating this workflow over and over would be tedious and inevitably lead to user error at some point. After clicking OK, we're given the same dialog that we saw on the live example. In this dialog, I again only had to select those three VCF files. So then you click Start Workflow, and then this is the only time uh, the user needs to interact with the software to fully complete a TRIO analysis workflow. After starting the workflow, you can go have lunch or visit your patients. And then one hour later, your project will look like this. Each row in this project is called a node. And each step in the workflow maps to approximately one or two nodes. And this means that doing this manually would take a lot of hands-on time uh, to select all of the options. The green icons at the bottom of the project are the final reports for each endpoint. This diagram will give you an idea of the number of variants that were filtered out in each step. So after importing the three VCF files, there were approximately 2.3 million variants in the data set. The initial exon filter greatly reduces this data set to around 38,000. Um, 36,000 high quality variants remain after the read depth and genotype quality filters are applied. 30,000 variants were predicted as damaging by at least one functional prediction algorithm. And 10,000 um, had a classification of something other than synonymous or unknown. Two of the variants matched a de novo inheritance pattern. 5,000 were found to be rare, based on the exome sequencing project data. 12 of those rare variants matched a recessive inheritance pattern. 3,000 matched um, the child heterozygous pattern. Um, and 85, uh, finally, 85 variants uh, were found in 45 compound heterozygous genes. 
As a clinician, uh, these final 100 variants should be considered for follow-up. If you had a more specific workflow, such as in the um, Ogden example, you may only have one or two variants to follow up on. Here's the generated um, workflow summary for this analysis. Um, since this workflow had the three distinct endpoints, the final variants for each endpoint are listed independently. In this report, I list the same information we saw before, um, the reference and alternate alleles, the gene, transcript information, and that PDOT notation. Um, in general, this report can be customized to fit regulatory compliance standards and the user's needs. Following the analysis, um, this report would then become part of the patient record. One final report um, is generated for each distinct endpoint and contains the important information found at each step in the workflow. And these reports, too, can be customized. Um, and part of that customization may include additional annotations. Any number of additional annotations can be included in the final variant report. Um, in SVS, variant level annotations are stored as IDF files um, and commonly referred to as tracks and, and, or annotation tracks. Um, and we can build these tracks based on spreadsheets in SVS or from um, um, any other text file. We have several annotations available for, on our data server already. Um, and we regularly curate new tracks from public databases. This screenshot shows several tracks um, in Golden Helix Free Product Genome Browse. And if you haven't tried Genome Browse out, Genome Browse out yet, um, I highly recommend it. It's free and awesome. Um, in fact, I will show you some of the rare recessive variants um, from that trio analysis workflow in Genome Browse. So I already have the three samples loaded into this project. I have the BAM files, which were um, created during the secondary analysis pipeline, and I have the VCF files, which were created upon completion of the secondary analysis pipeline. Um, the VCF or the BAM files will give us the coverage um, and the um, pileups, which aren't visible right now, uh, and the VCF file will give us the um, variants that were called at that location. Um, I have the three samples here, and the 12878 is the child, uh, 12891 is, and 12892 are the parents. Okay, so one of the features in Genome Browse is this ability to make a feature list based on any track. This first track here I made from the master annotation report um, for the rare recessive variant workflow. So to create a um, feature list of um, this track. So that feature list will give you all features found in the track. You just right click on the track and click feature list. Here we can see there are 12 features that correspond to those 12 variants that were found by the workflow. Um, if we jump right to here, we can see two rare recessive mutations that were inherited right by each other, um, which means most likely that they were inherited on the same haplotype. We can see the um, calls for these are pretty good, um, as in most of the reads map to the um, C to the mutation for the child, and about half of the reads map to the mutation um, for both parents, and about half map to the reference, um, which is what we expect with a recessive inheritance, uh, with a recessively inherited mutation. Here, um, 111 of um, this uh, mutation had a read depth of 111, and, 100, and all of those um, reads map to this location, as I mentioned. Um, this deletion um, was still pretty good um, and had a read depth of 109, um, and 100, 107 of those um, mapped to the deletion. And the deletion of the parents looks really good, too. Um, we can take a quick look at the pileup for this. Um, and this pileup view um, gives you the um, forward strand and the reverse strand. So it gives you those actual reads um, that are found in the BAM file. So that's kind of a nice way of looking at it, too, sometimes. I'll turn it off, though. I also have this genomic superdupes track loaded. Um, 
and this is the one I discussed earlier that maps segmental duplications to the genome. Since this region right here is white, it means that there are no segmental duplications that map to this particular region. However, if I go over here, um, we can see that this variant um, is covered by quite a few different segmental duplications. So each blue bar here is a different I can make that bigger is a different um, duplication that can that can map somewhere else in the genome. And it also gives you that per percentage of um, bases that map to the alternate region, so in this case 95 percent. Um, and that makes sense because these hash tagged or hashed um, regions right here, um, these correspond to reads that were um, multi-mapped. Um, and this is another nice feature in SVS is that you can turn these uh, multi-mapped alignments on and off. So if we turn the um, filtering off, uh, this variant almost looks like a heterozygous call because 43 of the um, reads mapped to a C and 44 mapped to a T. However, when we turn that back on, we can see that most of those reads that map to the C um, were due to uh, reads that could map elsewhere in the elsewhere in the genome and so we shouldn't trust those reads. And so that's a nice example of um, why this was called a homozygous call even though an, upon initially looking at it it might look like a heterozygous call. Okay, so now I will go back to the presentation. So Genome Browse um, is a free product um, and it will always be a free product and you can download it on our website. In conclusion, I'll reiterate how those tools I discussed um, benefit both researchers and clinicians. Clinicians uh, need to run well-defined workflows on numerous additional samples uh, while researchers will build and test new workflows um, and investigate data. Clinicians are required to have a minimum user interface knowledge to run an automated workflow, while researchers can take advantage of the more complex but intuitive interface in SVS. An automated workflow has a small learning curve, while the learning curve for the powerful toolbox in SVS is larger. An automated workflow limits a clinician's hands-on time enormously, um, giving them time to do the other things that they need to do. Um, while it SVS gives a researcher the power to investigate and manipulate data. So this diagram outlines the Golden Helix approach to creating these automated workflows. Our approach begins with developing um, a uh, workflow specification and we do that by working closely with clients in order to learn about their needs. The next step um, is to create a document and workflow diagram that will outline the requirements for the custom automated workflow. Then we will build a workflow prototype and this prototype will undergo the same thorough internal testing that we apply to our products and it will come with complete documentation. And finally, the finished product works seamlessly within SVS just as in the demonstrated examples. And this is part of our standard services offering. The turnaround time is between two to three months and we provide support for the custom um, workflow for one year. Thank you very much, Autumn. This was a fantastic uh, webinar, a fantastic presentation. And for, for those of you who are on online, uh, please continue to feel free to ask questions. We've got actually a bunch of them in. Um, but uh, feel free to type them. We'll continue to screen them. I have probably more questions here f uh, for this webinar than we possibly can answer in the uh, time we have for today. But I think we will try hard to go through as many as possible. Um, the, there are uh, <clears throat> a number of questions. It's just if I look at the so we're about 40 or so, uh, a number of them are actually about the specific workflows we have shown to you. And uh, just maybe as a general comment, those workflows are examples uh, of uh, workflows that we are um, seeing 
either in this or in a similar way in conjunction with working with our clients. We're not making those, you know, there's no recommendation on our part to use exactly that workflow, nor do we um, hand them out. Um, they are basically used as an example to show that we're actually, in fact, can automate all these steps and make it very simple to use SVS um, for someone else but in expertise. Um, but let's deep dive into some of the questions. I think there's some interesting there are some interesting topics here. <clears throat> so the first question um, is, um, can you describe the construction of the pedigree spreadsheet? And um, and Arlen, this is probably a very complex topic, but maybe you can um, say a few words about the subject. Sure. So um, the pedigree spreadsheet um, is a very simple format. Um, it requires six columns, um, and in general, this is something that we can work with um, our clients um, in order to automatically um, develop this, um, either by some sort of recognition within the sample name um, or some other some other um, structure that we that we could recognize and automatically generate this. Um, so yeah. it's not really something you have to worry about too much um, when you have an automated workflow. In SVS, it's something um, that is also easy to create. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, does the software support annotating the variants found with the COSMIC database? Uh, and yes, we have that track, um, the COSMIC track, available on our data server. Um, so this is something that um, can be included in an automated workflow. Um, and you can also just use it in SVS to annotate your variants. So that's something that we support. Mm -hmm. Maybe just, just a, a quick uh, clarification here, I think, uh, before we get into a misunderstanding, here's a question from um, one of the users. Uh, from the sequencing, uh, from the sequence data, does uh, Golden Helix have a workflow to generate VCF files? Okay, so yeah, this is something that um, we see people get confused about sometimes. So um, a secondary analysis pipeline will take a FASTQ file, um, and we'll generally create a VCF file. Um, so that's something that is done externally by something like um, BWA and GATK. And so the, um, tertiary analysis starts with that VCF file. So once you have the variant calls made, that's where Golden Helix um, SVS comes in. All right. All right. So that's uh, that's um, <clears throat> outside of our tool set. Right. Okay. Here's a here's a question. How does Golden Helix deal with deletion and insertion mutations? that are not found in the DBSNP or 1000 Genomes database. And I mean, this is really a, a straightforward um, uh, answer. I mean, um, at that point, if that's the case, uh, um, that mutation will be made uh, uh, visible and it will be treated as a de novo mutation. And then, you know, the researcher uh, has to look at this in more detail and, and see if there's uh, what, what, what is going on at that position. Um, there is a next question, there are a lot of them here. Uh, through X-Link, the affected mail showed R, R, R and R. Does it mean that X-Link variants show as homozygous? Um, so since um, Ogden syndrome um, affects the X chromosome, males are actually hemozygous um, for the mutation. Um, so in SVS, we represent um, all mutations as having two bases, even though on the X chromosome, they in fact, males only in fact have one. Um, mm -hmm. So it uh, just has one reference allele actually at that location. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a, <clears throat> there's a question that came up in this morning, in the morning session that we did with uh, folks from if for, uh, for the East Coast, uh, um, how helpful is SN, uh, SNP classification such as non-synonymous um, given the ENCODE data showed regulatory regions are even far imp are important, um, are, are more important than XN regions. Um, so this is the question essentially about uh, are we utilizing the ENCODE data? Um, and the answer is that we are currently working on that right now. Um, we don't support it at the moment, but it's something that we're working on. Um, this example, um, as Andreas mentioned, was just um, meant to demonstrate automated workflows. So we were interested in looking at um, exon regions and weren't interested in intron regions. 
Mm. Yeah, and I would say, by the way, and this is probably true for everybody in the industry. This is uh, the, res the the data came out uh, fairly recently, and so uh, th this is certainly some. Uh, this is subject to current research and you know establishing best practices at this point. Um, simple question: How much does Gmail browser co uh, cost? I think you mentioned it, but maybe say it again. It is free, and it will always be free. Yeah, and you can download it on our website. Um, <clears throat> Okay, a lot of questions on workflow specific things. Uh, I do understand. Uh, uh, the, oh, this is also software is publicly available. Yes, it is. The um, download link can be found on our website. We might we might be uh, what we I tell you what we do is we we'll include a link to our. Um, to the free genome browser in the blog that Autumn is publishing the next few days so that people find that also there uh, in an easy and accessible way. All right, so let, let's see, let's move on. Um, uh, this is a, this is probably a confusion. What coverage can one expect using the software? Again, that's, um, that's a, a sequencing topic, so this is more a question of what, what the sequencing te technology you're using is uh, what kind of coverage that the technology is providing is something that we just visualize in our uh, in our software. Um, next question is interesting. Oh, that's a good one. Is it possible to add custom databases into the auto workflow to further filter variants? Um, absolutely. So IDF files can be created by the user, um, and they're really easy to make. Um, all you need is the uh, variant information and whatever other information you want in the track. Um, and we can create that um, annotation track and use it during um, an automated workflow. And you can use it in the software as well. Mm -hmm. Here's more of a technical question. How to, uh, how to troubleshoot uh, if SVS auto workflow stops in the middle of processing uh, data? Uh, short answer, it shouldn't. Um, that's actually why we apply rigorous testing. Um, to this whole process, we'll test the these workflows that we are um, releasing as if it were a shrink wrap software. Um, but there's also um, there are uh, logging capabilities, or so everything that happens while the workflow is being executed is being logged, and so can be later on uh, analyzed. Um, let me see. A lot of questions. If uh, is there a mechanism for researchers to build a workflow that can be applied to many families in a study? Um, yes. The example I gave um, just had the one trio, um, but you can use any number of trios and family members in this data set, um, and that is handled um, really easily within the software. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a follow-up question again on the workflow. Topic: How do you actually implement automated workflows? Automated workflows. Do you ultimately generate a script or a set of scripts that the client runs? Um, how is the the workflow delivered to the client? I think is the answer. The, is the question here? Question right. here. Right. So um, we deliver the automated workflow in a um, compiled Python format, and so this um, Python format works um, just like any of the other tools in our software. Um, so it works really, really well, and it also comes with the um, complete documentation. All right. Okay, uh, next question. What if there had been an indel in the Octan workflow? Um, that's what a good is... question. So we, we could have included indels in that step. Um, we chose not to because of um, the background of that study. Um, so, so when you can make certain assumptions about your workflow, um, you can narrow down sort of um, the things that you want to see. Yeah, I think I have a lot of questions regarding the specific um, to the specifics of the workflow. Here's another one: What is the basis of the assumption that the casual variants must be extremely rare? Uh, in other words, what's the logic for filtering out rel relatively common variants? Sure. So. That all depends on the phenotype that you're studying. If you're studying a rare phenotype, which we see a lot of people studying, especially with sequencing data, um, you want to look for rare variants because it doesn't make sense um, that a rare phenotype could be described by a variant that's commonly found in the population. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, 
when will automated workflows be available? Um, they should be um, available in a f two to three months um, upon completion, but we're ready um, today to start talking with any more clients. We've, we've actually done this in the past, so it's um, not something um, that's brand new. Um, we've done different different workflow automation um, programs like this for for several of our clients. Yeah. Um, there is a related to that, are there specific workflows available? Um, there's specific questions about quadros with two affected children. Again, I um, we're, um, the way we handle it as a company, the, um, um, if there is a, a particular workflow that is um, it needs to be automated because you have multiple users that need to to use this, and you really don't want to train everybody at the same level of uh, to the to the expert level in using SVS. And this is a good choice. the uh, the The logic behind the workflow and the, the science behind it actually is yours, and so so we're not giving out other clients' workflows. No, we would do that with yours. This is something that um, um, can be developed and will be developed and uh, according to your needs. Um, maybe the last question here, which database was used to filter non-synonymous variances? Um, that's a good question and we actually have an internal algorithm um, that was written by one of our, our Rockstar programmers um, so that variant classification is all done internally. We don't use any external database there. Um, yeah. Okay, good, great. Well, Autumn, thank you again for putting together a fantastic presentation and answering all these questions uh, for uh, all of you out there. Thanks for participating and listening into this webinar. Um, we will have uh, the, the, the recording up in a few days. Slides are available. If you see that link that uh, Jessica uh, just published, you can download this at any time. And then um, just from a, from a Golden Helix perspective, um, 8.0 is coming up in the next few weeks, so look for uh, announcements on a new major release of our, our software. And then uh, for those of you who are coming to um, ASHG in Boston in October, please come to our booth. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for participating, wish you a great day, and hopefully to see you soon at one of our next webinars. Thank you very much.